Today, All Might and I are discussing pancreatitis. Thanks, guys. Pancreatitis is one of those diseases that we treated one way in the beginning, we're treating it a different way now. Part of it is due to the advancements in technology. Uh, the other part of it, honestly, is just knowing what we're doing. We've kind of learned a lot about pancreatitis and what to do and what not to do, and now we do it better. Before we get into pancreatitis, the main reason that this is a general surgery procedure is one, it used to be a surgical disease, now it's not, but two, one of the most common causes in the United States of pancreatitis is biliary pancreatitis, and even that name has changed. When I started uh, medical school, it was called gallstone pancreatitis because we assumed that the gallstones were falling down and irritating the pancreas, whereas now we better understand that it's a cytokine issue, not a gallstone issue specifically. But enough about that, pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is inflammation of the pancreas characterized by abdominal pain, plus an increase in your pancreatic enzymes. It is the leading GI cause of hospitalizations in the United States. The majority of these patients with acute pancreatitis, it's usually biliary pancreatitis due to their gallbladder. Once their liver enzyme, I mean, once their pancreas enzymes come down, we take the gallbladder out and they go home. The issue with acute pancreatitis is that you wanna get them before they turn into chronic pancreatitis. When they develop chronic pancreatitis, they will always have pain when they eat, that will be a big issue, and that's one of the largest changes over the past 10, 15 years, is we've now realized that we can't really treat chronic pancreatitis, and we have to do everything possible to get them corrected during this acute phase. Now, with regards to the cause of pancreatitis, 40 to 70% of these patients, biliary pancreatitis. It is again referred to as gallstone pancreatitis, but it's really more a cytokine response associated with the biliary tree, but most of those patients have gallstones as well. Outside of the United States, alcohol is number one, um, but inside the United States, alcohol is number two. Then you have this hypertriglyceridemia. You'll see these patients that have elevated um, triglycerides that are three to four times what a normal person has. So a little bit of eleva elevation in uh, your triglycerides is not gonna cause pancreatitis. It's a super high value and it's usually hereditary. If someone has a gallstone stuck in their biliary tree, and someone has to go get it, a GI doctor has to go get it, they can develop pancreatitis post endoscopic retrograde cholangial pancreatitis, ERCP. I keep forgetting it, but ERCP. Um, <clears throat> and then there's some other weird stuff that you get every once in a while. But again, the majority of patients with pancreatitis, gall, gallstones, biliary number one, alcohol number two. These patients present with severe epigastric pain. It is often in the middle of their belly and it goes up into the back. This pain is above and beyond what you see with regular um, acute cholecystitis. It is a severe pain and they always point to the middle of their upper abdomen and that's because the pancreas lives there. They will complain of back pain because it's a retroperitoneal structure and a lot of those nerves um, are innervated through the back. They will also have fever, uh, difficulty breathing, some hypotension. Um, in severe cases, this is when you start getting into necrotizing pancreatitis where their pancreas is starting to get chewed up or liquefied, uh, liquefied by some of the pancreas enzymes. They also can have trouble breathing, shortness of breath, um, and hypotension because of the amount of inflammation right where the pancreas sits. It sits near your um, inferior vena cava, it sits near your aorta, it sits kind of underneath the diaphragm where the stomach actually sits on top of it so that if you have a lot of inflammation, it does make it hard to breathe. This is probably a good time to talk about anatomy. So the brown thing's the liver. Um, the green stuff is the biliary tree. <clears throat> and you can see the gallbladder hangs out, connects to the um, 
hepatic duct that comes from the liver joins by the common bile duct. That common bile duct kind of enters into a common area with the main um, pancreatic duct right here, ampullar vater, sphincter of Odi, they both empty into the duodenum. So you can see, theoretically, if you have a stone that falls down here and causes a blockage, it can back up the enzymes into your pancreas. That was what our original thought was. Now we realize that it's more cytokine uh, motivated, so that stone causes, it, it by itself in the process, causes some irritation and you will have pancreatitis because we'll still see patients that have pancreatitis without gallstones. We take out their gallbladder and they get better. Back to labs. So <clears throat> one of the things that you always see is elevated amylase and lipase or one or both, usually about two to three times the upper limit of normal in patients with pancreatitis. Um, you can also sometimes see slight elevations in your white count. You don't necessarily have to have a fever and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have necrotizing pancreatitis or an infected fluid, but you can still see elevated CRPs. You can see anything that is an inflammatory marker. Pancreatitis can cause that to be elevated. Now, just because you have an elevated amylase and lipase, Technically, that does mean you have pancreatitis, but every once in a while, it may be something different, it may be transient, it may be resolving. So what we typically say is if you have a diagnosis of acute pancreatitis, you have to have at least two things, elevated enzymes or some type of finding that clinically suggests inflammation of your pancreas. So one, pain, persistent, severe epigastric pain, we talked about that. Elevated amylase and lipase, talked about that. Now the interesting part is for the CT, MRI, or ultrasound, you can get this haziness around the pancreas or inflammation around the pancreas because some patients will come in with persistent pain and their amylase and lipase will be normal. And you're like, well, they don't have pancreatitis. Well, when you order a CT scan and see that haziness around the pancreas, then you say, okay, this person has pancreatitis or had pancreatitis, and we're just looking at it resolving. Um, and some of these present differently. Amylase and lipase are a little higher, um, spike higher in biliary disease and they kind of trick down, trick down, trick down versus trickle down versus in alcoholic pancreatitis, they kind of just have this low, long curve. So the amylase and lipase will do this in biliary and it'll do this in alcohol. I always tell everybody, I think in biliary pancreatitis, in the hospital it does this because the patients will eat and it'll go back up and then they'll make them MPO and go back down. Um, <clears throat> but it's not quite that simple. As far as management of pancreatitis, we used to do a whole bunch of surgery, and we'll get into that later, but right now the management is truly supportive care. IV pain medication, because this does hurt. Um, the problem with IV pain medication in pancreatitis, though, or any pill, any even PO pain medication by mouth, is it can cause sphincter of Odi dysfunction. So you can actually cause problems with your pancreas by treating them with pain medication. So it's catch-22. Other than that, IV fluids, because there's so much inflammation associated with pancreatitis that they get this huge amount of fluid in the retroperitoneal space. You underappreciate how dehydrated those patients can be. So you have to make sure you're giving them adequate IV fluid hydration. And they're also MPO in the hospital. So again, maintenance IV fluids is necessary. Nutrition. We used to put everybody on TPN back in the day when they had pancreatitis. They'd walk in, put them on TPN, and we later learned that that's not always helpful. So what we'll do is make them MPO for usually five days. Go check the nutrition lecture, talk about that. But usually for five days, let the labs cool down, or we'll put them on a clear liquid diet without a lot of fat and a lot of sugar to activate uh, the pancreas when they eat. If they have acute on chronic pancreatitis and it's very severe and they can't get any PO food, sometimes what we'll do is place a J tube in the jejunum that's distal to the pancreas. So that way we can enterally feed them 
without activating the pancreas at all. And we see that a lot of times in patients with chronic pancreatitis, but it can occur in acute pancreatitis. Antibiotics in acute pancreatitis, when I started medicine, everybody got antibiotics. No matter what was wrong with you, if you had pancreatitis, you get antibiotics. Now, we don't do that. We kind of reserve it for patients with complicated pancreatitis, and it's really just due to the infectious disease doctors, Dr. Magadia, um, pushing the, don't use the big stuff for stuff you don't need to because a lot of this was prophylactic. Now, if these patients have necrotizing pancreatitis where their pancreas is getting dissolved by its own juices and that juice gets infected, those patients on big dog antibiotics all the time for a very long time. Chronic pancre acute pancreatitis, when it is ignored, can turn into uh, necrotizing pancreatitis. You can develop pancreatic pseudocyst. You can um, go from acute to chronic. That's where a lot of the surgical treatment is focused right now, not necessarily working on the pancreas. Um, in surgery, we always say there are a couple, th there are three things you never mess with. Um, it's the duodenum, pancreas, and a mother-in-law. As far as um, pseudocyst, uh, encapsulated fluid from the pancreas, it leaks and it kind of forms this ball or these little cysts. They will resolve on their own sometimes. Sometimes they won't. If they don't resolve on their own, we have to do drainage. Now this can be done endoscopically. So they'll go actually through the stomach, poke a hole in the stomach with an EGD scope and drain um, the pseudocyst that way. Sometimes they will actually do it with uh, endos endoscopic ultrasound or in radiology, we can sometimes get them to stick the cyst, if they're chronic and have a nice rind about them, drain them percutaneously as, as well. That'll tell us whether or not it communicates with the bili bili tree, with the biliary tree by checking the bilirubin, or if you aspirate it and it doesn't, it may go away completely on its own. If this has failed or you don't have a GI doctor or a um, radiologist with ovaries big enough to be able to do this, you sometimes have to do it surgically. And that's usually called a cyst gastrostomy, where we basically sew, make a hole in the stomach, in the back wall of the stomach, and then you actually go down and sew the edge of the stomach to the hole that you made in the cyst, and it drains there forever until that eventually scars down. Um, usually, we've gotten pretty good now with drainage endoscopically and percutaneously, so we don't have to do this as often um, as we used to. Chronic pancreatitis, you end up doing all this over and over again every other weekend, every other month, depending on how inflamed they are. Kind of addressing chronic pancreatitis is basically the same thing as acute. The only difference is sometimes we talk about doing surgery for chronic pancreatitis. This is probably more of historic importance because again, we've learned our lesson in surgery that it's better to prevent these patients from having these problems or catch them early than it is to just operate on them surgically because again, mother-in-laws don't do well with surgery. Historically, Pusto, never done one. That's just not true. I did one of these. I did one of them one time. Um, this is a treatment for chronic pancreatitis. You, you essentially take a loop of jejunum and sew it next to the pancreas and you connect the jejunum lengthwise to the main pancreatic duct. So you basically are taking it and sewing it right here to this duct so that that fluid can drain directly into the jejunum. When you have chronic pancreatitis, this pancreas is like a rock. It's not like pudding anymore. So you actually can sew to it, but it still leaks and it still causes problems. They can still develop pseudocyst right after the procedure. It's not a great operation, but it can help certain patients, but we just don't do it that much anymore. Um, if it's not in the body of the pancreas and it's in the head, 
and it's a big pseudocyst and it's causing a blockage or obstruction, your biliary is elevated, all these other problems, even though it's not cancer, you can do a pancreatic duodenectomy or a Whipple procedure, um, which is one of the biggest operations we do in general surgery for benign disease. The other reason you do it is if you have a mass in the head of the pancreas that you think is a pseudocyst, it's causing symptoms, but it also may have malignant features, that's another indication to do a Whipple because sometimes those patients do have small cancers that masquerade as pseudocysts. So we order CA-19-9, CA-125, AFP, a lot of tumor markers, and if any of those are elevated and you think it's a pseudocyst, you sometimes end up doing a Whipple. All right, Whipple, so y'all know what I'm talking about. Christine wrote the fancy version. Um, and <clears throat> so if, it's, if the mass is now in the distal pseudocyst or whatever, chronic pancreatitis is, is isolated to a section, you can go do a partial pancreatectomy. Distal pancreatectomy sometimes associated with a splenectomy just because of the way the artery is once you get out lateral. Um, problem with doing a distal pancreatectomy in a patient with chronic pancreatitis, because you never do it in acute, chronic pancreatitis is that duct will still leak on you because it's chronic and it's inflamed. So again, we try to avoid all of this by getting these patients, getting their gallbladders out or stop, to having them from, stop them from drinking. Pancreatitis, that's it. Realistically, biliary pancreatitis number one, alcoholic pancreatitis number two, uh, triglycerides. If it's biliary pancreatitis, you get the gallbladder out either at this time they're admitted or soon after they're discharged. Alcoholic pancreatitis, stop them from drinking and try to make sure that it's not biliary pancreatitis that you're missing. Triglycerides treatment, everything else uh, as it goes. Um, and we try to avoid doing surgery other than gallbladder surgery on these patients. They're miserable, they lose weight, they don't wanna be in the hospital, but they also don't wanna hurt. Treating them with chronic pain, and pain medication can actually make their pancreatitis worse. That's it. Do you have any questions? Let me know, we'll get them answered. Uh, yeah, that's it guys, take care, thanks.